let's pull together all the information we've covered in this chapter and just really kind of visualize it together here. So if I have my oxalic acid again, as my example, you can see that it's going to be a polyprotic acid. So let's just see what's going to happen for each of these regimes. Now, first thing we want to do is think through pKa. Our pKa1 is going to be at 1.25. And I'll even mention that oftentimes when we're talking about pKa, they leave off the A and just call it pK1. Don't fall into that trap with your base side, though. That's going to remain pKb2 for this one. Now, if you don't remember why it's pKb2, we'll come back to that in one moment. Now, our pKa2 is going to be 4.266. 1, 2, 3, 4.266. So, right around here, pKa2. Now remember, when we're counting along the pH scale, we're counting pKa. When we switch to the pKb scale, we begin counting from this end, and that's how we count where our pKbs are. So the order is covered by that. You'll see that that means that we're going to have totally different subscripted numbers on each of these pieces. Make sure you do that correctly. All right, so we've got our pKa's and pKbs all placed. Let's think through what's going to be happening if we throw anything in water. So if I throw my oxalic acid in, I'm going to be primarily forming something that's going to be a very strong acid, uh, a fairly strong acid at least, and we're going to be down in this pH regime. If I'm in this pH regime, I'm going to be working with the monosubstituted salt. There's a good term for us to be aware of. So that would be our HOX minus, creating something in this regime. And then out here, in this regime, we're going to have our OX2 minus form predominate. Now, we have to be very careful, though. We're talking about two things at the same time. If I throw my oxalic acid into water, so I take the powder and I stick it into water, then I need to actually solve the equation for that to find out what my pH will be. Now, of course, we remember that since these are far enough apart that they're not going to be happening at the same time, notice there's two full orders of magnitude between them. I'd say that's about three orders of magnitude away. You can see that's not bad, about three orders of magnitude. There would be one thousandth of the effect for pKa2 versus pKa1. We can safely neglect that. So we're going to say here we can treat it just like we would any other acid, and we can use our very short shortcut, where we say that Ka equals x squared over formal concentration minus x. If we're being very diligent in paying attention, we can even try out that assumption that this will be very small compared to formal concentration, and we can end up just having to do the square root of formal concentration uh, and Ka. I, I'd rather that we not do that all the time, but you're seeing it plenty in the book. You're using that assumption occasionally, so just make sure you're using it correctly. All that's reasonable. Now suppose that we do it in the opposite case. We know that over here, Kb1 is what's going to be taking effect. So we can say Kb1. In fact, let me go ahead and be more explicit here. Ka1 over there, Kb1 over here. That's going to equal my, again, x squared over formal concentration minus x. So we can solve that the exact same way. Now let me highlight a little danger here. Remember what pKb and Kb1 are actually referring to in terms of our process. We are now saying that we have, in this case, oxalic acids, oxalate ion, plus water, yields our HOx minus and OH minus. So we've got to make sure that we're accounting for the correct things when we actually set this up. Remember our ICE table very quickly, ooh, wow, all right, would be I've got formal concentration here, minus X gives me F minus X. Over here I've made, I started with none, I've made X, I've made more X, that gives me my X is my 
equilibrium. So make sure that when you solve for x, you're plugging it back in, correctly identifying this to be the OH minus concentration, calculating pOH, and from that, determining your pH. Now, if you're looking inside of the book, you'll also notice that there's another equation that they mentioned during the derivation, and they use one that actually uses pKa, or one of the pKa's. But it's because they're making sure they've specified what they have as part of the reaction. This is the one that you're typically going to be using. And if you're using what you saw in the book, just make sure that you're using the same balanced chemical equation. Overall, that's the key. When in doubt, don't just grab this equation off the shelf. Actually set up your BCE. Okay, now what about that intermediate form? Getting our quick gut check, we would say hey, we're going to be about halfway between these two pHs because we know that's going to be the average for it. So I'd probably guess that, let's see, I've got three pH units between them, so one and a half. So I'd probably say two, uh, 2.75 is probably going to be roughly where I'm at. So for this one, around 2.75-ish is going to be what happens when we throw in our HOX minus form. More rigorously, of course, we then go ahead and we grab our real equation that we want to be using all the time. And now for this regime, we're going to actually write concentration of H plus equals our square root. And once again, we're going to have K1 times K2 times our formal concentration. And that's going to be plus K1 times KW over, we're going to have our K1 value plus formal concentration. So we go ahead and we use that equation. Alternatively, if we had said that we threw this into a buffered solution that's in higher concentration than this species, then we could try doing an ICE table and actually calculating concentrations and ratios and percent ionization and all that good stuff. But be very careful to do these pieces separately. Determine your pKa 1 and 2. Determine your pKb 1 and 2. Decide what your predominant form is based on the pH that you're talking about. And from that you can help identify what equations you need to be using. Make sure you learn these equations. All three of these equations that we saw, the Ka one that we see over here, our Kb one that we see over here, and our intermediate form that we see here are going to be incredibly useful to us when we get to our titrations.